From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 143, recorded on November 27th, 2017. Everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today, right here in New York City, across the desk from me, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And dialing in from a remote location, Indeed. Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hey, Daniel. The, I use the old acronym, dialing in. Exactly. But there's no dial. No. There hasn't even That's been true. a dial on a phone for years. That's true. Click Clicking in. That's clicking right. In. But Dixon and I remember the dial phones, right? Do we? Do you, Daniel? You probably don't remember a dial phone. I, I'm old enough. I, I, re- I remember. <laughs> you know, and you wanted numbers where you didn't have to, like, spin it all the way. Sure. I remember before they had area codes. Yeah. They had the names of the districts, you know, like. Uh, yes. Clio yes. 5545. I love that. The exchange number. <laughs> Pennsylvania 435. <laughs> I remember our first, our first number in Patterson was AR45174. I still remember it. And AR stood for Armory. Interesting. Mine was DU for Dumont. I love those days. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Of course, in terms of infectious diseases, we don't love them because we didn't have as good therapy back then. Exactly. But, exactly. Uh, here we are. You have to give up some things to get some things. You do. That's disruptive technology for you. All right. Today we are going to go over our last case. Indeed. And Daniel, remind us. What's going on here? Yes. This was a case of a woman in her 50s. Uh, She was an an immigrant from a rural area with limited resources. And she was admitted to a hospital in the United States with iron deficient anemia and eosinophilia. And uh, being in the U.S., when they saw you were over the age of 50, had iron deficient anemia, she was sent for a colonoscopy. This is where it gets exciting. (laughs) <laughs> uh, they note on colonoscopy that there is a slender, serpiginous, motile, we'll say object. It's about four and a half centimeters in length. Uh, one end is slender and the other is large and curled but not blunt. Uh, this object, now we'll say worm, was sent to the parasitology lab for identification. And we left our our listeners with a couple questions. What might fit this description? Uh, Is there usually eosinophilia in this uh, disease? What about this anemia? Would we expect it to be severe or mild? And then um, would this person have to have come from outside the U.S. to acquire this? Uh, Or could you actually still acquire this infection in the United States? Right. All right. We have a number of responses because we are giving away a copy, a signed copy. We are. We parasitic are. diseases. This is the first of many, we hope. And so we will number these, and then I will pick a random number via a generator at the end. The first one is from Lucian, who writes, Dear Twip Masters, which parasite is it? Based on the morphology, I believe the patient had whipworm. The narrow end followed by a larger coiled end is indicative of whipworm, and the length is within the normal range. In addition, the adults live in the large intestine where a colonoscopy could discover them. Is it normally associated with eosinophilia? Severe cases can induce eosinophilia. Provides a link for that, along with intestinal bleeding and anemia. Is it normally associated with anemia? If the patient had a severe infection, the CDC reports that this can cause bloody stool. Perhaps if she was losing enough blood, this could lead to anemia. A case reported in gastrointestinal endoscopy also found eosinophilic gastroenteritis and borderline anemia in trichoriasis. Could it have come from a rural area in the U.S.? The CDC also reports that the whipworm is relatively rare in the U.S., that it is primarily a tropical disease. There are cases in the rural southeast. It is spread when humans ingest eggs found in human feces and is associated with warmer climes. The rural southeast United States certainly has very poor and subtropical regions. I shall now return to counting CFUs at the Listeria <laughs> lab I work in. Many thanks for the podcast. It makes time pass much more quickly and pleasantly. Lucian is at the University of Washington. 
Neat. All right. Dixon. Todd writes, Dear Twip Trichotomy. I like that. Me too. <laughs> I've been listening to Twip, Twim, and Twiv for two years, and this is my first correspondence. I really love your interesting podcasts and often listen during my long runs as I train for half and full marathons. I'm a med tech who is a research scientist at a pharmaceutical company in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. It is a typical fall day, partly cloudy and windy, with a temperature of 8 degrees C. The worm in TWIP 142 found on colonoscopy is a male adult whipworm, Trichurus trichura. Adult male whipworms have a coiled posterior, and females have blunt-ended posteriors. Trichuriasis is caused by ingesting embryonic embryonic eggs or ova from the environment. Ingested ova hatch in the small intestine and burrow into the crypts as larvae. After one to three months of maturation, the larvae migrate to the large intestine, cecum and ascending colon, where the thin, thread-like anterior end of the worm penetrates the mucosal epithelial cells and feeds on tissue secretions. Hmm, that's interesting. Histologic examination of the mucosa can reveal localized eosinophilic infiltration in the lamina propria. Eosinophilia in the peripheral blood is rarely seen in T. trichura infections. The posterior of the adult worm ruptures the cell membrane, matures, mates with nearby worms, and lavola, <laughs> lavoie, <laughs> or <laughs> there's an ova. <clears throat> in endemic areas, most mild infections lack symptoms, and only patients with severe infections are symptomatic. Symptoms may include abdominal pain, diarrhea, anemia, malnutrition, weight loss, appendicitis, intestinal bleeding, colonic obstruction, perforation, finger clubbing, abdominal tenderness, and anemia. Rectal prolapse can occur in children with large numbers of worms. Diagnosis can be made by identifying the ova in feces. This can be done with ANOVA and parasite screen ONP. Multiple samples may be necessary to see the ova, with some infections never resulting in a positive ONP. Mabendazole or albendazole daily for three days is the standard treatment. Um, <clears throat> right. Discontinued use of pesticides and the use of organic fertilizers causes the spread of this helminth. Humans are the principal host with infections also seen in lemurs, pigs, and monkeys. Five, hmm, I'm learning a lot from this one. A uh, five to 15 year age group has the most clinically significant cases because of their higher risk of eating soil. Interestingly, young boys are more likely to become infected as they tend to ingest more soil than girls. Infections are most common in warm, moist, tropical and subtropical climates. In the U.S., the most common area are areas of the Southern Appalachian Range and Gulf Coast states. Keep the informative twixt contact coming. Also, I would be very interested in seeing the three of you at a live podcast in New York City. Okay, because we mentioned that last time. And yeah, and he, that's the only. It. That's the only one who wants. It's to the see only it. one. Well, we can. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're not. <clears throat> a maybe much of a draw. <laughs> he could visit our studios here sometime. Maybe. All right. Daniel. Anthony writes. Recently, I noticed on the shelf of an enclosure of one of the rescue kittens, approximately a tablespoon of what appeared to be mucus with lumps. After wiping it onto a paper towel, paper towel, I inspected the material. Without my glasses, I spotted three or so worms. Because of the watch spring position, I at first thought they were ascaris. On closer scrutiny, even with diminished vision, I noticed discrepancies. The worms were much smaller and the width was much less than that of the usual roundworms. After finally fetching a pair of reading glasses, I was able to see that there was another striking distance. These worms were non-symmetrical. One end was much finer than the other, reasoning that probably the only common feline worm that I had not seen before my eyes was the whipworm. I did a Google image search for that. Google confirmed that the feral kitten indeed was afflicted with whipworms, Trichorus serratia. The case study for TWIP 142 conjured up a mental vision of the little demons that I'd found. It struck me that I'd not taken the most obvious precaution to check if the cat parasites were transmissible to humans. Right. I was relieved to be assured by the crystal ball of Google mm. that though people can catch whipworms, it's usually a different species, Trichurus trichura. And then we get a, a link here and the article above that he links to um, 
FBC often shows eosinophilia and rarely anemia. Mm-hmm. I'm not certain about the question concerning severity of anemia. The CDC says children with heavy infections can become severely anemic. Uh, Does that mean adults will only be mildly anemic? Question mark. Trichorus trichuria enjoys worldwide distribution and so can be caught anywhere that people and soil are found. Though the eggs are passed in feces and there's no vector intermediate host, transmission is not directly oral fecal fecal. The eggs need time in the earth, days or weeks to mature. This certainly is much more likely for those living under primitive condition in rural areas, both in and outside of the United States. Even so, city dwellers need to be concerned too. Patrons of New York City fine restaurants dining on salad (laughs) or fruit, not well washed, might get a little something not mentioned in the menu. Thank you. (laughs) Well, (laughs) Indeed. <laughs> hmm. All right, David writes, Dear hosts, it's been a while since I emailed in a guest, but after hearing the details presented in episode 142, I could not resist the temptation to answer, especially with a free signed book on the line. I suspect the woman from a rural area with limited resources has been infected with whipworm or Trichuris trichiura. The worm recovered nicely. Fit in the, the worm recovered nicely fits the description of a male <laughs> Whipworm, 45 millimeters in length and having both a long slender end and a thicker curled and blunt end. The larvae of this worm penetrate the mucosa of the large intestine, grow into adults in the colon. According to the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases, the resulting capillary damage and erosion caused by the worm may lead to iron deficiency, anemia, and inflammation, which fits the description of the patient's anemia. Trichuris has also been reported in causing marked peripheral eosinophilia in cases where anemia and dysentery are present. But still other sources claim that whipworm does not typically induce eosinophilia. It's possible she has another infection which is causing the eosinophilia and the anemia caused by the whipworm are what brought her into the hospital. Whipworm infection is worldwide but occurs most frequently in areas with poor public hygiene conducive to soil pollution, a warm climate, heavy rainfall, and dense shade. This includes several countries in Africa, Asia, and even has been widely reported in the southeast U.S. where it is the second most common nematode infection following enterobius. It is possible this woman is an immigrant from another tropical country where whipworm is endemic, or she is from an area in the southern U.S. with poor sanitary conditions. Thank you once again for the informative and entertaining podcasts. Mm -mm. Dixon. Dr. Wink writes, Dear TWIP team, my guess for the 4.5 centimeter modal worm in the large bowel is Trichuris trichiura. The size and shape and location are all right, and it was motile, suggested by the name Whipworm. The textbook says it can cause anemia. (laughs) Thanks for everything. If I win the textbook, I want to donate it to somewhere like Haiti. Thank you, Wink. I guess we should say if if Wink wins, we should ask people, too, if they want an English or a Spanish version, depending on where, you know, if they're going to be donating it. Yeah, absolutely. uh, (laughs) Haiti. Maybe Spanish wouldn't be quite as helpful, but it no. might be more helpful than English. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Melissa writes, hi, Twippians. After sniffing around and following the clues for the last case study, I'm finding this quite fun. <laughs> I wonder if this is what my dog feels like when I do nose work with him. <laughs> okay. <Gee. laughs> we'll here's, have to my, ask him. <laughs> here, here's my guess for this twip. I think Trichuris trichera fits the description of the worm. I look through the photos and descriptions of size and parasitic diseases to figure out what it could possibly be. Oh, wait, let's stop right there. She already has a book, so she could... No, that's not true. (laughs) Sorry. This could be the electronic, right? (laughs) It It could be be the electronic version. That's right. I looked through the photos and descriptions of size and parasitic diseases to figure out what it could possibly be. Once I got to Trichuris, I thought, wow. So this is what Daniel meant by one end is slender and the other, other is large and curled. After reading through the section, it doesn't seem like Trichuris trichura is associated with eosinophilia. As far as the anemia part, Trichuris doesn't ingest blood, but it can cause capillary damage and erosion, which will lead to blood loss and anemia. So I'm guessing mild anemia. It doesn't look like there are cases in Southeast United States anymore, but it could be just super rare now in that area. 
I think this female patient most likely picked this up from outside the U.S. in a developing country with poor sanitation since the eggs of the worm are excreted in human feces. Hopefully, my guess is correct. Moving on to your question, if anyone will come to TWIP in New York for a book signing. I'd love to, to go, but alas, it is too far. If you have it in San Diego at UCSD, I would definitely come by. Please keep the case studies coming. I'm having a blast searching around for the answer. Sincerely, Melissa. Mm. Well, that that's a yes, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Another Melissa writes, Dear Twipozoites, I just discovered this podcast and I am hooked. I have a PhD in neurobiology, but no medical background. I am fascinated by parasites, though, especially the weird eukaryotes, and I thought I'd take a stab at your case this week. <laughs> this case seemed like a good one to start with because they actually found a worm or a long, a slender, serpiginous, motile object, as you described it. <laughs> My first thought was a tinea tapeworm, as there is a width differential between the head or scolex and the mature proglottis at the tail. However, the worm described was only four and a half centimeters long, which would be tiny for a tapeworm. And furthermore, one end of the extracted worm was large and curled, but not blunt. Size and morphology, therefore, rule out tapeworm. Next idea, an intestinal fluke. <laughs> I could find only one fluke that attains this size, Fasciolopsis busci. Eosinophilia and anemia would fit with F. Berkey. Is it Berkey or Busky? Busky. Busky infection. However, the shape described doesn't match a fluke, so I ruled this out as well. After two strikes, I moved on from phylum platyhelminthes to phylum nematoda. I found a nematode that matches the size and shape almost immediately, and this is my official guess, human whipworm trichurus trichiura. All right, few, a few little information here, which we've heard that it's worldwide. Uh, southeastern U.S., two to three million people infected, usually asymptomatic, so I surmise the patient has a moderate to heavy infection based on anemia, more than 50 worms. Eosinophilia not present in all patients. Panicker's textbook of medical parasitology states that eosinophilia may be present in early stage of the infection. A paper from 2014 suggests about half of patients with trichuria infection display eosinophilia, although this paper studied indigenous Australians in remote communities. And I don't know how far I can generalize this result. <laughs> Anemia is not normally a symptom of light infection, but can be associated with heavy infection. A cursory PubMed search turned up a few studies of anemia in children or pregnant women with trichoriasis, but I couldn't find a good reference for levels of hemoglobin in infected non-pregnant women. So I'm not sure, but I'm going to go with mild anemia, as anemia in pregnant women seems to be mild, even with a heavy worm burden. Treatment mebendazole. I was fascinated to read that this probably works by inhibiting tubulin polymerization. She should also receive iron supplements for the anemia. I would love to hear your thoughts on deliberate infection with T. trichiura for diseases such as IBD. Thanks, and keep up the awesome work. Dixon. Ulaiha. Hey, TWIP team. Long-time listener, first-time answerer here. I just want to thank you all for all your hard work reaching out to and enlightening thousands of listeners like me. Based on the information Daniel has given... I would suspect that this is a case of trichuriasis, the infection of the body by the whipworm Trichurus trichiura. These runworms, when found in the body, localize to the cecum after reaching adulthood and can grow to the listed length of 4.5 centimeters. Interestingly, the worm recovered from this patient would have likely been a male as the posterior end was described as curled, in contrast to the female's typically blunt end. Eosinophilia is a common phenomenon in trichuriasis and other helminthic infections, so this is also a match. As for the reported anemia, I suspect it could be related, as the infection can elicit bloody diarrhea in affected individuals. However, I would guess that the anemia would be rather mild, <clears throat> unless, of course, this individual has been experiencing bloody diarrhea for an extended period of time, info not given. Finally, there are those infections are these infections only found in immigrants? Well, epidemiologically, trichuriasis is common in most underdeveloped areas of the world where it is contracted via the ingestion of eggs and contaminated food, water, or fecal matter. Hmm, maybe not. Maybe not the last one. It should be noted, however, that there are cases of whipworm that are reported in the southeastern portion of the United States. This according to the CDC website. As mentioned in earlier TWIPs, this region still lags behind the rest of the country in terms of technological and societal advances, leading to the perpetuation of some of these infections and ailments. Keep up the great work. It's always a pleasure to listen to you guys. 
regards. From Ithaca. He's from Ithaca. Mm. That's your old stomping grounds, Vincent. Yes. Uh, he says, P.S. Of course, P.S. I was wondering if I could suggest an episode, either a twim or twip, dedicated to Borrelia burgdorferi, the ideologic agent of Lyme disease. I have personally been affected by this disease and subsequent illness, now termed post-treatment Lyme disease disorder. But the Lyme disease realm is rife with controversy, societally, scientifically, and now legally, see article below. So it would really be great, interesting to hear what you guys uh might be talking about it. There is even a world-renowned Lyme disease center at Columbia run by Brian Fallon. Regardless, thanks again for everything. Hey, Daniel, are you an expert on Lyme disease? Um, I, I guess I'm going to say yes. Okay, good. Um, we'll, do a, we'll do an episode <laughs> sometime. Do you ever have a you know, case of Lyme? Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, here on Long Island, we see about 30,000 cases a year. So yeah. um, it's wow. it's sort of hard to practice infectious disease here and not not become something of an expert. And, uh, you know, I, I always I think my parents conspire to put me into the world of infectious <laughs> disease, you know, because I look back. at So here I was in high school and my parents were living in um, Greenwich Village, right? The, the epicenter of the HIV epidemic. But they had a weekend house in Lyme, Connecticut. Oh, bingo. <laughs> Just there was this very interesting tick-borne uh, ailment on the rise. Amazing. So, uh, All right. So we'll do an episode. Uh, we'll we'll have, talk about it. And Daniel. I'd love will. it. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating disease. Well, there's, a lot a, of, there's an interesting Columbia connection there, too, by the way. Okay. Because one of those, uh, the original family that was diagnosed at the NIH, I don't want to spoil the whole story. Yeah. One of them actually ended up coming to medical school here. And he had to go to school in a wheelchair because he was so disabled from it. Mm. Wow. But All right. So we'd love to talk about that. Okay. So we'll cross fertilize. There you go. <laughs> We're crossing uh, kingdoms. <laughs> Ga- Gavin writes Dear hosts, Vivax. Nice. <laughs> my, my case guess for the approximately 50 year old woman in the whipworm, Trichurus trichira, when I first heard worm and iron deficiency anemia, I jumped to hookworm. But that didn't check out for a number of reasons. Hookworms are smaller. Females are 7 to 13 millimeters and are typically found in the small intestine. I don't know how particular hookworms are to the small intestine, but I was able to find a video of hookworms on endoscopy, but not colonoscopy. Whipworm fits the size and morphological description given and are frequently found on colonoscopy. Ascaris, pinworm, and anisakis are also commonly found on colonoscopy, at least in Korea, but don't match the description as well. Treat with mebendazole or albendazole. T. trichura occasionally presents with eosinophilia. I think this may be due to immune modulation and the limited degree of tissue penetration. Anemia is normally only seen in severe cases, but is generally less severe than hookworm. This person could have acquired this in the American South, especially given the recent news regarding hookworm. Thanks for the fantastic case. We covered causes of anemia before the break, so this topic has been on my mind. If I win the book, I'll leave it in the student lounge for my peers. Excellent. And, and Gavin is uh, he's in the class of 2021 at the UCSF School of Medicine. Nice. Yeah, you could leave it in the lounge because nobody would steal it. <laughs> <laughs> Adam writes, hi, I'm writing this on the go, so take it for what it is. I, I don't understand what that means on the go. Is he writing... <laughs> Like in a motorcycle or yeah, He might car. be jogging and writing on his text. He might text <laughs> and jog at the same To me, the case in 142 <laughs> sounds like whipworm, Trichurus trichura. I cannot find that it's usually associated with eosinophilia. The anemia is usually mild. It seems doubtful that whipworm infection alone can explain this patient's findings, and further investigation might be needed. The infection might have been acquired in the U.S. A few weeks ago... A listener suggested a This Week in Global Health. I know you guys are busy, but I think this is a great idea. Also, some time ago, you introduced an executive summary, summarizing the article you had discussed and the implications of its findings. I really appreciated this, but lately you seem to have forgotten about it. Uh Just a friendly reminder. Finally, I I must say I'm really looking forward to the video series. It's going to be awesome. Adam is a medical intern in 
Halmstad, Sweden. Very nice. Probably I'm not supposed to say Stad, right? That's more German. Yeah. How would you say it, Dixon? Halmstad? Halmstad. Halmstad. I know. Halmstad. Okay. We should do the summaries, right? Yes. Don't you think? Absolutely. Summarize. We did forget. And you know, over on TWIP, no, TWIV, um, I still have in the show notes, summarize the paper, and I just ignore it. Right. And we were also going to include a hero profile this time, too. I just have to reach up. Oh, you're going to get the book because you're going to prepare it. Okay. No, I'm prepared. That, that's later, so you don't have to worry. But you better get ready. Yeah. I'm going to get ready. All right, Daniel. That was a pretty good guesses, don't you think? I think they were excellent. Um, consistently excellent. <laughs> They're all the same, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> consistently excellent and on target. Um no, and I and ho- hopefully we did a good job of, um, and I think people went through this a little. We we started off with the you know here's the anemia, and so we got people thinking um, about one potential parasite, and then we moved on to a description of what it was, the fact that it was located in the colon, and I think people moved from the hookworm idea to the the whipworm, and the whipworm really you know when you see the whipworm, and even I, I think when you see the egg, it, these are these are objects that are so um, characteristic that that it's I don't know, hard hard to not remember them once you've seen the whipworm and get the idea of why why it's actually considered or called a whipworm. It really looks like a whip. Um, I think particularly the female, Dixon. I don't know if you would agree as much. the The female has like this nice handle and then a whip that comes out. Right. Um, the male actually the the end spirals a bit, so it doesn't Does. quite have that same whip look, but it still has this um, great degree of asymmetry. One this one is end is quite thick and the other really tapers and is narrow. And we always love to ask people, where's the head? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. They always think it's at the blunt end, but it's actually at the thin end. Yeah, which is interesting. So another uh, feature there, the, just to explain why the male is curly-tailed, is that most uh, nematodes have spicules uh, there are mating spicules that they actually insert into the vulva of the female. And the t- the curl of the tail accommodates these two curved spicules because once they're inserted into the vulva, it, it's sort of like it, it holds them attached until they finish mating. So it's an attachment um, extension. So maybe we should maybe we should so there were a couple of questions that I brought up for people, but I think again to uh, go back to what we promised we would do. Let's start off with a little review of the life cycle, right? Exactly. And I think that our um, our listeners, our email writers, went through this a little. But one of the first things that we need to think about is how do you contract this? And so it is through ingestion of embryonated eggs, right? I, I think that's that's an interesting concept. So I, I remember, you know, what was it? Something like, uh, I'm going to go back here, almost 30 years ago, Dixon, when you were teaching me uh, parasitology. <laughs> almost 30 you know, years ago. And you hear these things for the first time, you're like, why do I have to remember L2, L3, <laughs> embryonated, not, why did they care about these? Right. But uh, maybe, maybe you want to talk a little about this concept, yeah. embryonation. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, I mean, every egg has to embryonate. Let's just Take a, the most typical example that everybody can remember and recognize, and that is a chicken egg. You know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, it, the egg came first, obviously. And so the egg sits <laughs> in an incubator, and it, it incubates. It's allowing the embryo inside to undergo its development. And that takes time. And the time frame that it takes depends on many things. And, of course, it depends on the genetics of the organism, but it also depends on the time that the embryo takes to fill up and use up the food source inside the egg itself. So for chickens, I think it's 21 days. And the egg yolk is the source of food, and the chicken is it's self-contained, obviously. So when the egg hatches, out comes a little version of a chicken. Mm-mm. So when you look at these eggs, remember we discussed Enterobius as one of the fastest embryonating organisms on Earth. It takes six to eight hours from a single cell to develop into a fully developed larva. That's an incredible rate of multiplication and differentiation. Uh, Trichuris, on the other hand, takes almost a week. So one of these uh, people who wrote in suggested that fecal contamination could serve as a source of the infection. And, And I reacted a little bit at that point because I thought this person probably forgot that the egg has to incubate for at least a week before it's infectious. 
You can't ingest the feces of a person who was infected and catch this parasite this way. So it has to sit around for a while, and that usually occurs in the soil. So that's that's the reason why uh, the embryonation period is so important because sometimes people will come back from a trip, like it's a three-day trip, let's say, and they come back and they have diarrhea, and they and I don't think they would come in and say, doctor, do you think I have worms? But the doctor might think, well, where have you been? Well, I went to the Dominican Republic for a three-day jaunt to, a, a you know, like a club met or something like this. And I came back, and they said, well, you see, I wonder if they could have worms. Well, you know that they can't have Trichuris because, or Ascaris for that matter, because they both have the same incubation time in the soil to develop from a single egg that's fertilized to a fully infectious embryo. And, and that's the reason why it's important to think about this delay of about a week. And sometimes it's even longer depending on the temperature at which the egg embryonates because in, in some semi-tropical regions, it could take up to two weeks for this to occur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think – so that's the first part we'll start with to reinforce over this concept of the eggs in many of these um, yep. parasites will will continue to, to mature. The egg matures. It becomes embryonated. Finally, it becomes infective at this point. Then it then is ingested, right? So it's not yep. direct – you don't catch this from people. Nope. You catch this from eating dirt. So stop eating dirt. <laughs> once, you, once you eat it, once the eggs are ingested – the larvae are going to hatch, right? right? So back to our eggs are going to hatch in the small intestine. And then there's a migration phase. And where are they migrating? But to the colon um, where they will mature. And this maturation, again, this ah. is important for the clinician to, to know when they're thinking of the diagnosis. Same. It could take up to 90 days before they start producing eggs. Correct. And so, again, if someone is thinking about, you know, oh, we're going to do our O&P, you got to be thinking. I, I just uh, finished some CME I was doing recently, and it's the world of infectious disease is about this concept of things take time is, is you know, these incubation yeah, yeah. periods. That's right. That's right. And so the adults mature in the colon, and there's males and females, and they're, they're doing stuff that males and females do. Right. And uh, that Dixon's with spicules and all. Um, and only then do the eggs start to pass out into the stool. That's right. And when they pass out in the feces, they end up they have to end up in soil, right? So this is why great sanitation systems. If you yeah, yeah. are defecating into a um, sanitation system, right. these are not going to find the dirt where they can undergo this embryonation. So you can actually interrupt the cycle there. But if you don't, in many parts of the world, if the feces ends up with eggs in the soil, they can right. embryonate. And then somehow that can end up back. Now, what is it, North Korea, where they use night soil? <laughs> Not um, just there. Half of the world uses night soil. Half I, I, of the world. Yeah, I'm glad you make that point, right? Because in the news, oh, my, can you believe it? It's like, well, actually. That's right. That's my half. uncle in night soil. Well, because it's collected usually sometime during the night <laughs> and then collected and, and amassed together the next day and mixed with a little water and thrown out on the crops. Hmm. That's why it's called night soil. But I want to come back to another point. Daniel, do you remember when I gave you your lecture 30 years ago? I mentioned this time period under which you acquire the disease and then the time period when it starts to produce eggs. What is that period referred to? I bet you know. You know, your your quiz your quiz <laughs> Because I think the, we should probably use those terms now. So Should we talk about patency and pre patency? Those- exactly. <laughs> you know, you got an I know you got an A in my course. So and that's the reason why you're one of our <laughs> our steady contributors to this fucking parasitism. I'm just making a I'm making this all up, everybody. Uh, we're so pleased to have him. Uh, but but that's exactly right. So the pre patent period for this thing is long. But you could still detect this in one other way, couldn't you? Sure you All could. Right. Are you going to tell us, Dixon? No, you already told us. <laughs> that's this case history. Yeah, exactly. And that's interesting. <laughs> in, in this case, this you know, when you see this, uh, this adult, shall we say, we don't know if this has actually reached patency, shall we say. Right. We don't know if this adult is actually producing eggs yet. Nope. But it uh, was discovered on a colonoscopy, right? Yeah. So you said they suspected she was from the tropics, so they automatically did a colonoscopy? No, no. The the thing was, you're in the U.S., you're over the age of 50, and you have anemia. Got it. So yeah. they thought about bowel tumor and things like that. Yeah, it probably was, yeah. And I, I think, actually, the decision to do colonoscopy had nothing to do with parasites. It had to right. do with colon cancer That's concerns. Right. And a lot of these are discovered by accident that way, too, I must add. Yeah. 
That's a very interesting concept. Incidental. An incidental finding. Daniel, were you there when this uh, this worm was pulled out or these worms were pulled out? You know, it was interesting. I was thinking as we were going through the emails, for me, this was more of like the elevator conversation. Hey, you know what we found? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> right, right. That's right. And, uh, you know, and, and there was, you know, there was, I guess, the only input from an infectious disease person was, uh, you know, are you going to give her some medicine? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, but one that, of these, one of the responses was really uh, insightful in the sense that this might be a, a trivial infection. She might have only a few of these worms because they only saw one, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about the picture that we demonstrated in her book, and I'll, I'll find the page for it, it's a picture of a small child with a uh, rectal prolapse, and you can actually make the diagnosis by looking at the worms on the rectal prolapse. There are so many of these worms. It's on page 212 of edition 6 for parasitic diseases. It's a, you know, figure 17.5. The the worms are uh, profuse in numbers. In this case, they saw a single worm. So you'd say, well, she's an adult. She's probably got a normal diet and she's still anemic and she's got a worm. Did this worm cause that anemia? And, you know, do a school examination. Do a stool examination. If you do, you might find something else there too. So, yeah. Daniel, <clears throat> after we're finished discovering what the cause of this uh, worm, what the name of this worm is, and I think everybody agrees what it is, then we have to jump to the actual diagnosis, right? Yeah. So, I mean, in this case, we we I'd say we we know from the description we were told by the parasitology uh, laboratory that this was whipworm. Um, they removed it, right, to send it out. Um, but they also treated her with albendazole for um, three days, and that's a little okay. bit of a difference. Some worms you treat for one day, some you do yeah. for three. And it's, you know, it's, uh, I, I think for a lot of people, it might be a look up how many days you're going to treat them. Um, but then uh, a couple things that we asked in our, in our questions, I guess we'll go through these. Um, so, you know, what fits this description? Whipworm, we got that. Um, is this usually associated with eosinophilia and particularly with as mild as we're describing here? I mean, they did a full colonoscopy and they saw one adult. Right. Um, you know, in this case, uh, it has to be a separate investigation for why does she have eosinophilia? Because right. this this doesn't explain it. This doesn't say, oh, now we know why. Right. Um, and that also with what about the anemia? I'm not sure that this is enough to cause anemia either severe or mild. Um, and then I think some of our emailers talked about in cases of heavy infection, particularly in children, you can end up with severe and adults may be mild. And part of that is that the highest worm burden tends to be in children in this five to 15 year period, sure. um, which um, I don't know if we completely understand, right? But we have a number of ideas. One is it may be a maturation of the TH type two response. So, um, so we may be seeing a maturation of the immune system, but also there's as we get older, I think we eat less dirt. There's sort of a peak dirt <laughs> ingestion phase of life. We lose that urge, <laughs> particularly for males, right? Males eat a lot of dirt when they're between five and fifteen. Right. We start dishing it as less. an older person, but we don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we dish it out when we're older. But um, so, and then. The last one, which I find really interesting before we get, I think, where you're going is, so does this person have to leave the U.S.? And we don't, we don't know the incidence of a lot of um, parasitic worms, um, soil-transmitted helminths in the U.S. But as we're realizing from some recent work, which I know Peter Hotez has been involved with, yes, right. is you do not need to leave the United States to find um, soil uh, transmitted helmets. We have a significant problem um, with on our own borders. That's right. Uh, so I I don't feel like this person would have to leave the U.S. And the interesting issue you could actually ask is how long had this person been in the U.S. Because these worms don't actually live that long. Um, and so that that could help you if you sort of said you know she said oh I came here a decade ago I wouldn't think that we would see an adult worm after a decade. No, you're right. I agree with you. And so you can you can look a little bit there. So we could uh, ask the, the <clears throat> we can ask the following question then, and I'll just be the innocent mm -hmm. bystander here. After you've treated this woman, did her eosinophilia and anemia go away? So I I don't have much follow up past past this uh, warm too part. Bad. Past too bad. Dinner. But I think it is interesting because there's a whole you know there's a whole nother workup coming for yeah. non non probably um, 
parasitological problems sure. going on. So is mebendazole a good drug to use for hookworm too? So you can you can use um, for whipworm or hookworm. Where you go? With, well, no, I I know it's a good uh, drug for trichuris, but uh, if you gave it thinking, well, maybe there's a trichuris that I missed, so I'll just give her the drug and, to make sure. But actually, her anemia was due to hookworm. Because you didn't look for that yet. Would it also yeah. knock out the hookworm? And therefore, you would have concluded incorrectly that because you gave mebendazole and knocked out the other trichuris worm that happened to be located somewhere where you didn't see it, uh, the anemia went away, and therefore, it was due to this. It might have been due to something else. Yeah. So... And you were just lucky that the drug affects both of these worms similarly. I think that's one of the challenges sometimes with the fact that we have drugs that don't treat just one yeah, disease, right? Exactly. You know, you, exactly. Uh, and, and we didn't even mention Ascaris, but she could have easily had Ascaris because they live a longer time. Yeah. You know, and particularly if she's coming from overseas, she also could have yeah. had strong There's There's a lot of exactly. other things. Exactly. You know, and I'd say if anything, I'd say the bendazoles are going to be even more effective. You know, we talk about the fact that whipworm, you want the three days where a hookworm, you probably get by with just a single dose. True. We must say that in the in the long run, however, colonoscopy is an expensive way to make the diagnosis for trichuris. <laughs> 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 We'd much rather would, do a stool exam or something else we, like it that. It would be interesting, though, if we had a stool exam which said, oh, this woman had whipworm, you still, over the age of 50, are deficient anemia. Yeah, you, no, you, you, you still, still. Need, Yeah, you still need it for the colon cancer. You would, so. you would. That's true. That's yeah. true. I feel like women don't, women don't get the, the degree of colon cancer screening that men get for some odd... Um, mental reason i think but you know i would say everyone over the age of 50 if you're listening you know get your colonoscopy let's not have you die of uh, colon cancer yeah. mm-hmm. so that. you can keep listening and writing in hear that and what was your you had something else some other question that you were sort of going for anything else that we should be talking about with uh with trichuris trichera whether she was infectious for anybody else obviously that was another good if she has a family should, yeah. she, should she alert the people of their family that, you know, I have trichuris, so you have to watch out for me? Um, the answer would be no, as long as she used the sanitary facilities that were available, uh, which were not available where she came from, perhaps. Or that isn't even necessarily true. I mean, she could have accidentally ingested this at a restaurant or maybe from one of her kids coming in from outside and playing and that sort of thing. So there could be a, a, a different um, take on her lifestyle based on where she's from than the fact that it's not sanitary uh, all over. I mean, of course, they might have flush toilets, but they may also have a an outdoor um, problem uh, related to, let's say, the use of feces as fertilizer and something like that. Yeah. Dixon, at this moment in time, yeah. what percentage of the human population <laughs> has at least one kind of worm in uh, their intestine? Two, two-thirds. Two-thirds? Two -thirds? Yeah, it's, a, it's around two-thirds. Wow. It's a lot of weight. And that's excluding enterobius, <laughs> right? Mm. So that that's, you know, another thing we never, never, never consider, but we should, is calorie deficiencies, all right? These are malnutritional situations, which we're feeding worms. We're eating the right amount of food. We're just not getting it to the right place. And so without these worms, that amount of food might be adequate to, mm -hmm. to, to continue a normal life. So you know, getting rid of them is a major, uh, a major goal to to strive for. You know, I was going to say that question that you asked Vincent has been um, has been asked quite a bit lately, right? Mm -hmm. With the right. with the North Korean, um, you know, <laughs> right. cause of course we we use that with our propaganda to talk about how horrible North Korea is and how wonderful the U.S. is, but yeah, right. uh, but it came up and you saw a various number of answers depending upon which um, parasitic. Um, organisms were being considered from, you know, one third, half, yeah. two thirds. And yeah, and I think that was nice that you brought up something like pinworm. Uh, you know, we, what do we say? Ascaris alone, about a third of the planet. So you're, you're a third of the way there just with one of them. And then you add 600 million with another. And then, you know, it's, it's yeah. pretty amazing, the parasite burden. And schistosomes and, you know, there's a lot of worms out there, folks. There's a lot of worms. Yeah. There's a lot of worms out there. That's a great title. <laughs> <laughs> and they want to come in here. <laughs> they do. They want to join us. They do. They think we're great hosts also. <laughs> yeah. We're the TWIP hosts. We are the TWIP hosts. All right. Is that all, Daniel? Are we ready to move forward? I think that's it. I think all hopefully right. we did our we did our executive summary of we our did. 
of our parasite. All right, we have a paper from Science Magazine. It's called Plasmepsins 9 and 10 are essential and druggable mediators of malaria, parasite, egress, and invasion. Yes. First author is Armia Nasamu, and the last author is Daniel Goldberg. You know Danny? I do. They are from a number of institutions. They are. Washington University School of Medicine, the National Institutes of Health, yep. University of Manchester, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Indeed. And this is about, so plasmepsins are aspartic proteases. Right. Let's, let's um, break that up. Or deconstruct. <laughs> Are you the enzyme? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We know what a protease is, an we enzyme do. that digests. Pro what is an aspartic protease? Right. Do you so, know? Yes, I do, actually. I happen to know the answer to this because I studied um, pepsin and its derivatives as a result of having to work on trichinella. So I got interested in proteases in general. They're all hydrolases. They all hydrolyze by, by splitting polypeptide chains are big proteins up into smaller bits. And this particular group attacks it at the aspartic acid residue, where that wherever you find an aspartic acid residue, the enzyme will cut. Okay. And the serine proteases, they're, they're characterized by this. The threonine, the serines, the lysines, the aspartines, all of those uh, proteases uh, attack the peptide at the level at which that amino acid is found. That's a simple, easy thing to remember. Which is why I remembered it. <laughs> I'm not a biochemist, but I do remember some of the essentials from that. So it seems as though, and it doesn't just seem as though, this Daniel Goldberg is a world expert on proteases, and he studies cathepsins of all kinds, which are uh, lysosomal-based uh, proteases. And he, has, and he got interested in malaria because they obviously have a lot. They have 10 different plasmepsins, 10 different ones. I have to correct you. Please. <laughs> I'm correctable. Like, an aspartate protease has an aspartate in the active site. It doesn't cleave that uh, aspartate. Oh, it's misnamed. Then. Well, look, it's not it's misnamed. It has not, an aspartic acid at the active site. But like serine, serine has a serine protease at the active site. And that's not where they cut? No, 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 no. No. I thought each one had a specific no. amino acid. Well, they may, they may have uh, uh, cleavage way. specificity, but oh, the name dear. derives from the kind of uh, amino acid oh. in the... In the as side. as, um, as yeah. many of our politicians have been prone to saying recently, I'm I'm so yes. embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> and ashamed. <laughs> That's okay. I can cut it out if you'd like. No, 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 no. Leave it in. It's fine. It's just Don't mind. my old ignorance on this one. So these are uh, enzymes, proteases, and this particular paper is about the ten aspartic proteases encoded in the genome of Plasmodium falciparum. Ten, ten quite, different, quite remarkable, and they're I given think. Roman numerals from one to ten, as if they were Super Bowls or something. I don't <laughs> exactly. get that. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right, but uh, this paper investigates two of them, nine and ten, yes, um, to see whether they uh, would be nice targets for developing anti-malarials. Right. Right, that's basically it. Yep. And they have a lovely assay for uh, turning on or turning off the synthesis of said aspartate proteases. Okay. It's called the Tet R Aptomer Conditional Knockdown Technology. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> Essentially, what they do is they use CRISPR to edit the genes encoding these proteases, they insert a stem loop structure, which will bind a tetracycline repressor protein and block translation. It's amazing. Okay. And they can control whether the tet repressor blocks or not by adding a small molecule that, um, that binds to the tet repressor. So anhydrotetracycline uh, will bind to this. Um, and block it from bind, from translational repression. So if they if they remove this from the medium, this small tetracycline analog, then you'll get uh, repression. Okay, so system. so you got to remember that because we'll talk about it. Take out tet, you're going to get translational repression. Right. All right. And so they do this for nine and ten genes. Yep. All right. To create two different plasmodium falciparum cell lines, all right? And they show that, in fact, the system works. They can look at protein levels. And Dick Dixon, here's my first 
question. <laughs> uh -oh. They say, we see I a major... I got the first one wrong. This is your second That's question. That's okay. We see a major <laughs> decrease in target protein levels in late stage schizons. Right. Why that stage? Well, because they have all the cycle growing in vitro, yeah. and the, the, the uh, assumption of this paper is that <clears throat> these proteases are essential for the ability of the parasite to enter a red cell or to leave it. And then it has nothing to do with the, the growth of the parasite inside the red cell. So if you look inside the red cell as to what's going on, the merozoite mm -hmm. goes in, it creates a parasitophagus vacuum, it starts eating heme, which is, by the way, Dan Goldberg's other specialty is to look at how heme is degraded by the parasite. And What's that called when they take the iron that's left and they put it in something? What yeah, is yeah. Well, they, they make hemozoan. Hemozoan. That's right. Thank you. And that's a waste product. But guess what? It turns out that some of that heme is used by the parasite also to make its cytochrome Cs. Yeah. So that's very interesting, too. That's a side note. But the point is that the late schizont is the stage which then bursts out of the red cell. All right. And so that's they, the one they want to look at. So these they looked at, and they say there was also decreased replication. Right. Of what? The, the skyzon? Yeah. Fewer skyzons. Right. Because when they fail to break out, then they can't infect a new red cell. And then, therefore, the reproduction is down. So there you go. Right away, they have a result. In they the have a result. two paragraphs of the paper, right. they show when you knock down these... Um, that result probably took three years to find proteases, out. proteases, <laughs> you get a, a lower replication. Right. So then they want to know, what's the stage... That this is happening exactly at, right exactly, and they look at uh, the effect of depleting on the cell cycle progression. Now here, Dixon will have to help us again. Oh dear, <laughs> with these stages. So, okay. yeah. um, so when they take down these nine or ten, when they knock down nine or ten, they develop normally until they reached segmented schizonts. Is it schizonts or skyzonts? Either one. They're both correct. Or sh no, I no, can't say that. Skyzons. It's that's like schizophrenia. That's the same derivative. Schizon. Schiz it's a divide. It's a divided. So skyzons, the merozoite starts out as a single entity, and then it undergoes a very complicated replication. Okay. And they're all connected together until the very last moment when they split apart, leaving the hemozone inside the red cell, and then they burst out to infect new red right. cells. Okay. So here, yeah, this is about forty-four hours. Right. Normal development. Right. And then. After that, between 46 and 52 hours, normal numbers of schizons egressed. Yeah. No matter whether they had this nine or not. It means he egress means he leaves Leave. the uh, old red cell. However, uh, in, the, in, re in the condition of repression, yeah. um, they had one-fourth as many rings, new uh -huh. rings. Uh -huh. well, they went to a jewelry store and bought they, rings. <laughs> they bought a signet <laughs> ring and they said, wow, that looks just like my grandmother. What does that mean, <laughs> new rings? A new, well, it means that the merozoites that were released mm -hmm. after the skyzont stage, they broke off the stems they were all connected to, and now they're individual infectious units. They could not get into another red cell. So, so there was an egress defect. An, no, an infection. It's an invasion de, uh, defect in this case. Well, they say here a similar uh, one-fourth as many new rings right. with either one knocking down. And 80% right. uh, uh, had egressed. Uh, with the tetracycline, which means they're making the protein, whereas only th 36 had egressed in the minus tet Okay, culture. so that's that's definitely the an egress. aggression. Thing. And then they say, even taking this egress defect, we observe fewer rings, so there must be an invasion phenotype, which is what you're talking about. Exactly. Okay, So they've it. got both looking. They have to look at both stages. So we have e egress and invasion, and P.T. Right. Barnum would be proud. <laughs> well, there's one born every minute, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> is that what he said? <laughs> yes, he did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's very it's true. too bad we're not talking about hookworms, you know, because that, that is a sucker born every minute. <laughs> so P9, this is the summary, is involved in... Invasion in P10 is both egress and invasion. It is both. That's okay. correct. That so they've correct. got the... Um, they've got good data to back them up. Very office. nice. Lovely. Yep. And they, they wanted to know where these proteins were in the cell. This is exactly. one of your favorite things. Right? I love this part. If you were working today, you would have so many more tools. I would. So they could put tags on these proteins they and can. see where they're going. And you love this tag. They put a fantastic tag on Come on, tell us what it is. <laughs> Epitope tags. Yeah. <clears throat> they could do immunoelectron microscopy. Exactly. P9 was found largely in the bulbs of rop tree, secretory, 
organelles that are involved in eva- invasion. Right. And P10 was found in exonemes. Right. Which is involved in egress. What the heck is an exoneme? Now, what's this ROP tree? <laughs> rope tree. Rope, it's rope, rope tree. or ROP. Either one. <laughs> it's not we, quite like skies on and skis on, but it's, it's close. <laughs> rope trees, right. <laughs> rope trees. So rope trees are common in all of the apicomplexa. The apicomplexa includes yeah. toxoplasma. It does. What else? Cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium, right. Cyclospora. Wow. That's right. So it's a structure. Yes. Involved in... It is. It's a subcellular organelle, which has a tube-like structure to it that exits through the apical end, which is the attachment point that the organism uses to start its invasion. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a complicated. It looks series. like a rocket because it looks like it has fuel well, tanks. You know what it looks like. <laughs> I do have a a, a a a a cartoon version of of the uh, merozoite that I uh, posted to you. So it would help the people trying to follow this language to see a visual image as they're reading along. And it helped me even because I I haven't kept up with this literature as well as I should, uh, although I got very excited about the results that they produced. Um, So these there are several subcellular particles that are not associated either with the rope trees or with the micronemes. One is called a dense granule. Mm-hmm. And the other one's called an exoneme, for lack of a better word. Exoneme. The exoneme is called that because it uses it to exit the red cell. Got it. All right. Exit. All right. So these are <clears throat> these two proteins, nine and ten. These proteases are associated with rope tree, rope trees, and exoneme. That is correct. Right. Now, interestingly, they find that uh, there's a there's a rope tree bulb protein called RAP one. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And it's we should usually, get fifty cent to sing that for us. <laughs> yeah, rap one. It's it's usually processed, <laughs> right? And without P nine, it's not processed. So right. apparently, that's the protease involved in this processing Isn't to make it active, right? And what do they call it? They they have a word for these uh, maturases. They're called maturases. maturases. Yes, these are proteases that that cleave other proteins inside the parasite, which are then used to do the actual. Job. Right. That's right. And so you've That's got right. maturases, and the, and so X uh, uh, nine and ten may be maturases. And the the consequence of this, when you when you inhibit or de- lower the level of these proteases, is you get a ROP tree biogenesis defect. Right. So because one of these ROP tree proteins is not cleaved, you get a defect in, in this structure of the ROP tree. Uh, then they look at the exoneme. There's a prote. There's a protease. Uh-huh. This is a subtle isen serine protease, which would mean <laughs> no, it's a, got serine a serine in the, in the active, active site. site. Right. Okay. It's called sub one. Okay. It, it plays a critical role in egress and invasion. Right. And that's also processed. Yeah. And that process yes. is mediated by PM10. It's crazy stuff. Right, because when they lower PM10, That's right. that thing isn't processed properly. And isn't not that only incredible? that, it, it's an incredible because it's, they, it, it's <laughs> robots. Making robots, you know, <laughs> enzymes processing for enzymes. And then there's another autolytic process that occurs after it's cleaved, and it can cleave off another part of itself to make it even smaller. Some of those proteases are autoprotolytic. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a wonderful world when you get down into that smaller world. There's another uh, protease uh, there's, during egress. Yeah. Um, Sub one, which we just talked Sub about. Sub one is in the um, if I can, dense Ex- granule exoneme. There, no, that's in the dense granule. I think sub one is a uh, exonemal protein. Really? Yeah, but sub one processes a family of cysteine proteases. Now, what are they? They have uh, cysteine in the active site, right? right? And if, in a family of merozoite surface proteins, it's made as a precursor and processed. Right. In the absence of tetracycline, where we have repression. Um, it wasn't processed, and so PM10 is involved in processing of uh, that sub one. Subtle, one. very interesting. Uh, and now the the other thing they do is they um, they produce a, a, uh, a they introduce a second copy of the ten number ten protease gene. Yes, uh, with an active site aspartate mutation that makes it inactive. And yes. these these uh, malaria don't grow well, but if then they Put in a second wild type copy, uh, they grow fine. Yes. So this shows that enzymatic activity is needed for the function because they're knocking out the enzymatic activity with a single amino acid change. So that's cool. I like that kind of very, experiment, very right? Because cool. you could argue that just knocking it down. That's right. That's right. You don't know if it's enzymatic <laughs> activity that it needed, right? Right. 
So, uh, Daniel, you okay so far? I was just going to say that I know when I read that part, I was like, oh, Vincent will like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's nice, it's nice that uh, I think we can do things like that. I mean, really say, okay, this there's this correlation here, right. but let's really prove the causality. That's, let's show that right. it's actually the active site. So, yes, no, so far things are moving along. Sure. The last part of the paper deals with the, uh, the drug, the druggable target. Yes, and they right. say that there have been many inhibitors of aspartate proteases that have anti-malarial activity, but we don't know what the targets are for them. So exactly. can we contribute now that we've made these interesting reagents? Right. So they look at three amino hydantoins, okay, which they, they were identified in a screen from a chemical collection that cause schizont accumulation reminiscent of their knockdown phenotype. When they knock right. down the protease, you get, you get, uh, uh, schizont accumulation, yep. and this these drugs do the same thing. So they say, uh, are these drugs targeting 10, 9, and 10 proteases, exactly. right? Exactly. You following me? Very much so. Clear, and so what they do is- Crystal, they, they, as they would say in A Few Good Men. <laughs> they do dose-response dose curves for the wild type and the knockdown parasites. Yeah. And so basically, you know, if you don't have- uh, the proteins, and it's not going to be a target there, so you can need a lot more drug to have any effect. Right. You know, so what they find is that uh, the um, knockdown confers um, hypersensitivity when expression is low. Exactly. So they think that the, in fact, PM um, PM ten is the target of these amino hydantoins. Remarkable. And and furthermore, they do some really other things that go back to what we were talking about before, yeah. they show that these inhibitors block maturation of those proteins that we talked about, sub-1 and, and right. CRF5, right. which was seen in the, in the knockdown. Uh, and they also have a fluorogenic peptide substrate, uh, which whose cleavage is needed, dependent on PM10, and mm -hmm. these drugs inhibit that as well. Right. And then finally, they say th this other drug, they have CWHM117, uh, which also targets uh, these proteases. This has oral efficacy in a mouse model, so therefore PMX, which is the target of that inhibitor, uh, is a good target for anti-malarial chemotherapy. It's Isn't that a very cool? exciting future. Uh, they've opened up a new uh, approach. So basically we have, this paper has indicated, <laughs> has investigated two proteases, aspartate proteases in plasmodium, uh, what are they, plasmepsins 9 and 10? They find that they're involved in ingress and egress. Into in, what? Things? Ingress <laughs> or invasion. Invasion. <laughs> and, e and, and egress from where? Into what and from where? They all originate inside the red cell when they break out. They're now in the, in the, the bloodstream. And where do, they go, where do they invade? They go back into, into another, another red cell. Red cell. Another so red in cell. and out of a red cell. In and out of a red cell. Okay. And... They seem to be targets, these proteases seem to be targets for known drugs that inhibit malaria. Exactly. They show that they exactly. could possibly be used. And so these are kind of nice reagents for uh, also doing more drug screens. So one, one danger here, of course, would be that if unless they can target the aspartate or the serine, then there's a chance for a mutation which would get around that block. Of course, always, right? So it, it's better so Dixon, to get two or three things. Two or three, exactly. Multi-drug treatment, right? Yep. Just like HIV. -AIDS. Yeah, exactly right. That's what I was thinking about. Daniel, what do you think about this? Uh, these proteases as targets? So, you know, I, I always feel like there's a lag, um, you know, and as you guys were just starting to touch on with, let's say, HIV or tuberculosis, um, where we realize you have a challenge, you treat it with an agent that's effective for a while, and what do you get? You get resistance. So I, I think it's really just a matter of time before we start looking at malaria the same way and saying we need to be treating with dual drug therapy so that we don't end up with the emergence of resistance. And so I think it's great that we're starting to find more potential targets because ideally when you treat malaria, I think, you know, in the future, we will not treat someone with just artemisin as our acute and then maybe doxycycline as our second. We'll, we'll have double therapy at all stages targeting two different mechanisms to reduce the chance of developing resistance because, you know, think about 
how many hundreds of millions of people are infected with malaria? How many millions of people are treated? You know, the numbers there where whatever therapy you use, you end up eventually developing resistance. So mm. I think this is great. You know, they, as they describe, they have a mouse model. Um, of malaria where they can try these um, inhibitors out. They have a really nice high throughput screening method now. Um, yes. We're understanding at a better level what we're actually targeting. Um, I think these are the kind of tools and studies that we're going to need um, for the future so that you we bet. can stay ahead of malaria. That's right. Dixon, what did you like about this paper? Everything. I Everything. loved it. And I loved it from start to finish because, I mean, Let's say 80% of what I read, I understood. I'm glad that you cleared up the Casper, uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and the uh, – and the, you didn't mention the uh, hemagglutinin fragment that was used as the immunolocator. Uh, HA tag, yeah. It's a fantastic – It's like a short – it's like 10 no, amino acids. It's that brilliant, though. It's brilliant. Allow because, antibody to, yeah. Because you know that you're not going to get a cross-reaction to that in kind a of strange organism. So let me explain it a little better. Please so do. you have this protein's – we don't have antibodies to these proteins. No. It would take months to purify the protein, inject them into rabbits, good, make antibodies. Good point. So instead, what you do is you take a 10 amino acid sequence from the flu hemagglutinin, which is known to be, it's an epitope. Known, we have antibodies you can buy that will recognize that. You in, introduce that tag, we call it, into your protein, and now you wow. have instant wow. ways to detect it. That's With the caveat that, what is the caveat? Cross reactions? No. If you put the tag in, it's not going to disrupt the function oh, of the yeah. protein it in can't any d- way. Annoy the biology at all. And this is often something that people raise. You say, okay, we use yeah, an yeah. HA tag to look at the cellular location, and people say, how do you know it hasn't been changed by putting the tag in? <laughs> sure, which is a sure. totally valid sure, sure, point, right? Sure. And usually the reviewers will be picky and say that. <laughs> None of the GFP type proteins seem to do that, though, however, do they? Because they're used so because frequently. Because GFP is even bigger. Because, of course, yeah, 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 it's right. 200 amino acids to get green fluorescence. Isn't right? it a miracle that it doesn't disrupt it then? Yeah, sometimes it does. <clears throat> oh, okay. It does. Some, and in fact, you know, sometimes you put it at the end terminus and it disrupts the function. You So you, then uh, what you do is you put it at the C terminus and hope yeah. it doesn't. Okay. You know, think, okay. you have to play these games. All right. That's a cool paper. No, I loved it. I loved it from start to finish. And plus, it's a very visual paper also because you can... I think you like visual papers, No, but of course you? I do. Yeah, sure, sure. I it's, like it's, I like the ones you listen to. <laughs> the kind that make you sick. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Just remember, spartate, serine, cysteine, Yeah, proteases. yeah, I'll get it straight. That's the amino acid. I'm sure I knew it when I had to, but I... I it's Okay. That, Slipped through a, a crack in my uh, my plaque. Do you brain. know? Do you know what an aspartate protease would cleave? I don't know what the specificity is. Let's know. look. Aspartate protease specificity. Uh, we'll ask Doctor Google. Ask. I think I think it can actually be fairly broad. We'll, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. And it's because it's using a an activated water molecule. So you you really. You have, I think, each enzyme, and that's probably the challenge here, is yeah. that you don't have the specificity of um, you know, saying, oh, now I know exactly what this will cleave. They tend to cleave peptide bonds that have hydrophobic residues. Okay. Okay? All right. So there you go. It, is, it can be many it different sites. Hydrolyzes at that point. All right. Um, well, no, I, why don't I read one of our do heroes? Your, uh, do your hero. Let's Who is this hero? hero? Well, this hero, we're doing these... Alphabetically, we're working our way through the book. Oh, you're going to have me as a hero. Thank you. Thank <laughs> we you. are. And do you do you feel like we got our executive summary in there? Yeah. Hopefully, at the end. Do you want to try it again? <laughs> you can do it again. But I think we did. Yeah. No, I think we did. So. They did, and I. By the way, I enjoyed that part of the paper also. What's that? Because they had an executive summary at the end as well as an abstract at the beginning, and it was easy to read, easy to understand. Once you've read the paper, you go back and look. Oh yeah, yeah, that's what they did. It was just spot on. Okay. Good, clean work. Who's the uh, executive, uh, our hero, sorry? Our hero today is Joseph Bancroft, M.D. Oh, born something in, Bancrofty. Oh, there you go. He was born in 1836, and he died in 1894. Joseph Bancroft's lifelong passion for medicine was augmented by his interest in edible plants, <laughs> And he conducted research aimed at improving disease resistance for some important commercial crops, for instance, wheat, sugar cane, bananas. Bancroft also worked on leprosy and was the first to describe the adult worm of Wuchereria bancrofti. It bears his name and that of Wuchere. 
He suggested that lymphatic filaria might be transmitted by mosquitoes, an idea that was later championed by Patrick Manson, who was given credit for describing that portion of the worm's life cycle. So he was a forerunner and uh, had vision of, of uh, good biology mm-hmm. and was very broad in his uh, scope of interests. And and it was a physician on top of all of that. So I think that he's to be uh, commended for his um, uh, ecumenism with regards to his view of science. It's all related. Wukuraria, Bancrofty. Well, and corn and wheat diseases all and all kinds stuff, of other yeah. things. If you throw that all together, he would have been a very interesting man to have at the dinner table. I think you have his picture up on your wall. I do, I you? do. Yes, I do. In fact, that's that's where this one was derived from. I had to copy it. So. Wouldn't you like to have dinner with someone like that? You know, where the conversation could go from one Possibly, kingdom to the next. <laughs> really, if he's paying, yeah. And, and then eventually he would say, well, by the way, don't eat that. <laughs> oh, it's too late. Oh, I'm so sorry, Dr. Racaniello. We'll have to see you in my clinic. <laughs> that's that's a disadvantage of going to dinner with a parasitologist. And just having you to- You don't do that when I go to dinner with you. I don't. No, I, I would never, never do that. We, you, The three of us went to dinner recently and you didn't we mention- did? No, we didn't have to. We had a good, nice, nice um, parasite-free dinner, as I thought. I don't know. Maybe it had some Chikura's Trichiura. Uh Well, hopefully they were cooked. <laughs> if you have a salad, though, you know. Ah, this is true. Or sprouts, you know, bean sprouts. You know, you're raising all kinds of interesting issues here that we've all right. covered before. <laughs> good. That was our hero. Thank That's you very much. Hero. Now, Daniel, would you by any chance happen to have a case for us? I I do I do actually. Why are you let, surprised? Let me, <laughs> no, I was I was I was actually uh, distracted by uh, the use of that that word acumenism. <laughs> really? Is it, is so it what you do? Look it up. Or, is it acumenism oh, or ecumenism? Ec- ec- I was trying. Ec- it was ecumenism. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a case. Hopefully, people will enjoy this one, and uh, they hopefully, like them all. I okay. think they do. <laughs> Okay, so this is this is a case that goes back a ways, and I did this on purpose. I, I always pick cases on purpose with particular characteristics because I have something that I want to talk about on my soapbox, right? So, <laughs> so this is actually a case from the 1990s. This was seen by a colleague of mine oh. quite a while ago, and this was a boy in his um, late teens, young man in his late teens, who initially presented to an emergency room in the United States with a chief complaint of visual disturbances. He also had itching that was so bad that he could not sleep. Now, he had um, he had immigrated, recently immigrated to the United States from an area in Mexico, Oaxaca, um, and he had come to the U.S. in search of work, right? This is back in the 1990s. And uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about Oaxaca to get sort of setting setting the scene. Um, so he's asked to describe what life was like back in Mexico. And in Mexico, he lived in a very modest dwelling with uh, dirt floors. Mm. There was no running water. So he got his water from the local river. Now, maybe some of our listeners have been to Oaxaca, but there's a, a river that runs through, a, say, sort of the western edge of town. And he was the one who was in, his job was his chore, was to go get the water for the family. Uh, he reports that there were dogs, many farm animals, lots of insects near his home in Mexico. Okay, gives us a little bit of a background. Um, on exam, we're going to jump to that. He has tender nodules on his head. His skin is very irritated from scratching. And on his eye exam, he has small um, punctate lesions on the cornea, on the right cornea is what what we learn. Um, What I will tell you, I'm going to give you just a little bit more information. I think you guys probably have enough. I think um, everyone probably has enough. He he ends up being referred to, uh, to specialists. Who are going to get involved? the the uh, the punctate lesions in the ER. They actually call in an ophthalmologist because of the vision, and that's one of the. I was actually asked this question recently: is when you're in the emergency room, like what doctors are available? And um, there's in a lot of facilities now we have board certified emergency physicians, but they can call in specialists if they feel like this is something that's very time sensitive and we need something right now. So he was actually seen in the ER by um, an ophthalmologist, and then he's referred for further diagnostics. Another case of visual disturbances. We had one recently. With itching. 
Did we have itching in that one also? Mm-hmm. This one has itching, though. This one has lots no, of itching. Yeah. yeah, that one had no itching. No itching in that one, yes. I think it's useful to look across all of our cases and try and you know tie things together I hear to see saying. commonalities and distinctions, right? I, I totally agree. To to uh, hone your <clears throat> diagnostic acumen. That's right. Acumen. That's right. <laughs> or okay. Acumen. <laughs> acumen. All right, that's a good one. It is. Now let me see if there's anything else. Uh, and this boy, aside from um, these issues, does he has no other medical issues as far as we know? Not that we know of. He's not HIV positive, right? No, no. He's HIV negative. And um, what uh, you, you told us he gets water from the local river. Where, where does he get his food from? Um, so, you know, the nice thing, I, I guess I'll say, in parts of Mexico is that there's, um, you know, lots of beans and corn, and so lots of corn tortillas, um, beans, some rice. Um, it, you know, it. He, I'm sure he eats vegetables as well. I'm sure he ate vegetables. Wow, it's these beans and corn, that's making me hungry. And, and pigs. <laughs> and pigs. Pork. Sure. Yep, and there's um, there are pigs down there. That's important as well. Yeah, I think I'd like to go to a Mexican restaurant tonight for dinner. Great idea. Gonna That's see a wonderful. My idea. wife will be interested. There's one right, nice one right around the corner. Nice. All right. Any questions from you, Daniel Dixon? I mean, <laughs> uh, well, I have no no questions that I would uh, ask uh, in a way which would give away the case. All right. And I think that's enough. I think Very that good. should give us a good differential. And absolutely. All right. Let's do a few emails. We have some. We have one from Melissa who also wrote for the cases. This one came in late last time. Uh-huh. I very much enjoy listening to your case studies. I've never written to TWIP before, but there is a first time for everything. I've only written to TWIM. I used to work in Dr. Pride's lab working with his Viron projects, but I've moved on to the dreaded <laughs> environmental health and safety department that researchers fear working with. <laughs> I over exaggerate, I hope. My hmm. time in the lab has definitely proved useful when working with labs. I do not fear EHNS. <laughs> no. Not at all, because I'm on the biosafety committee here, and exactly. therefore I have gotten to learn. You have nothing to fear but yourself. <laughs> Here's my thought process. So this is for last week's case, which was, um, yeah, I don't remember. It was three organisms. It was the commensal oh, that's amoeba, right. right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. For the OMP, I heard, when I heard entamoeba coli, I imagined an amoeba in the intestines, a quick search showed that uh, E. coli, intamoeba coli, is generally considered a harmless non-pathogenic resident. I'm not sure what endolimax nano was, but it also showed up on the same page that said <laughs> e-, e. coli was generally non-pathogenic. Right. I searched again for blastocystis hominis, which said whether it can cause infection with symptoms or not is up for debate. This is now getting bookmarked in my mind. Mm-hmm. Since Daniel is already addressing the salmonella and she's getting better enough to get discharged, I don't think the blastocystis is give, have, giving her any problems. Some people can carry it f- without any problems. In two weeks when she comes back, I would just make sure she isn't still constipated or having diarrhea or any other intestinal problems since blastocystis hominis symptoms range from diarrhea to excessive flatulence. If she isn't having any problems, I would imagine she's good to go. If I'm completely out in left field on my response... That's the reason why I'm not a doctor. Ha ha. <laughs> oh, you can be a doctor and st- well, ha 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 ha. <laughs> Thanks and for still and still be out of left. Field. Absolutely, <laughs> or even not even in the right ballpark. <laughs> Thanks for keeping my days fun. I look forward to listening to many more TWIP episodes. All right, All right. thank you, Melissa. Yeah, D- Dixon, uh, can you read the next, sure. please? Anthony writes. And he puts a link to an article. He does. And Dixon, can you tell us what this article is about? Well, I can read the article for you right now. It says, in quotes, we have found dozens of fully grown parasitic worms in his damaged intestines, unquote, said Dr. Lee Cook Jong, a lead surgeon. It was a serious parasitic infection. And that was the reference to the defector from North Korea, the soldier that actually escaped being killed by his compatriots that were shooting at him. And he was uh, hit at least five times by gunfire. And um, my guess, <clears throat> I have a secret guess about Let this. Let me ask you first. So he was he must have had an abdominal damage. That's why they're down there, right? He did. That's exactly and when they were sewing him up, 
they anastomosing his new te- intestines. They well, found worms in it. When they opened them up there, they were because that blasted right through part of his small intestine. I see. Yeah, they actually showed a picture of it. Uh, I my guess is that his his North Korean buddies were not aiming to kill. That's that's my um, hope that they were trying to allow him to escape by not shooting to kill, and they didn't, and therefore he was able to escape. And these were Ascaris worms, right? Well, they didn't say what they were, but we're about to. <clears throat> it says, during a news briefing this week, Dr. Lee showed photographs of worms as long as 10 or 11 inches. Experts in parasitic worms were not surprised, however. They said that the finding was consistent with the broad sense of conditions in the isolated, impoverished North. You know, that's a slam at North Korea. I'm going <laughs> to tell you right now that if you had been a defector from Thailand to Cambodia, you would have found the same thing. Um, what, about Al- what about Alabama? Yeah, well, we're we're not <laughs> you know, going in that direction, but that would be uh, consistent yeah. with the findings. Defectors to the south have cited the existence of parasites and, and abysmal nutrition. Uh, because it lacks chemical fertilizers, North Korea relies on human excrement to fertilize its fields, helping parasites to spread, the experts said. that's what half of the world does so that North Korea is well within the limits of normal considering uh, the fact that it's a very poor country and it's poor probably because it's spending all of its uh, uh, discretionary money on uh, nuclear weaponry, et cetera, and not on, you know, public health programs. That's, that's my take on that. That was my own injection of Paris of politics. So to take it for what it's worth. Daniel, um, <clears throat> I don't know if they, look through all of his intestines, right? So maybe there are some worms left inside. In which case, would you treat him with a, uh, with a drug to to take care of that or what, Daniel? I I would. And I, I think it would be unlikely in this context that he would have just Ascaris. Right. right? So I I think it wouldn't be surprising if there were other infections, but I I know that they're using this, I'll I'll say propaganda, you know, as like how, how horrible are things in North Korea. (laughs) But I I think we have to be honest. We, we have Ascaris in the United States as well. So I think that, you know, if, if we think that this is so horrible that people are living in impoverished conditions with uh, helmets in North Korea, I think we might need to do something about things at home as well. Well, that, so. was, the, that was the gist of Peter Hotez's article, wasn't it? Yeah. The very recent one that he wrote. I looked up the county that he was referring to in his article, Peter, and it's halfway between uh, Mobile and Birmingham. Yeah. So Dan- exactly how Daniel, remind us how using human fer- feces as fertilizers would lead to him getting Ascaris. Yeah, so this again brings up that thing we talked about with the embryonation. So in the human feces, there's going to be unembryonated eggs of various um, helminths. And then over time, you know, a week to three weeks, depending on temperature, humidity, another, a number of things, these eggs will then um, embryonate. So they're going to basically evolve. They're going to continue to mature to the point where they're now infectious. And then when you um, ingest the food, uh, so let's say you have a, a nice salad and you haven't gotten everything off of that. And um, it is amazing. Um, uh, hundreds of thousands of eggs are produced per, you know, Per worm, depending on some of these species, right? I mean, so there's a tremendous amount of eggs that are in this um, night soil that's being out there. You ingest it in, and then it's going to go through uh, the different life cycles we've exactly, talked about. Right. Hmm. And so you could you could be importing food from a certain part of the world, and depending oh, yeah. upon the time, you can end up with embryonated eggs in your salad in New York City or any other cosmopolitan location. Why do you think I'm pushing so hard for vertical farming? in places that really need it the most, especially when malnutrition is an issue, uh, this would solve that problem. Because you wouldn't have to use fertilizers uh, that are that are contaminated Maybe with uh, parasites. Maybe I'm pushing as hard as I can. Maybe you have to scare people. Well, they're scared. They're, I can you tell you they're scared. You have to stand scared. up there with a worm, a 12-inch worm, <laughs> hold it up and say, you could get this right here in New York City. By the way, I did that at the ASP meeting. You did? <laughs> no, no, ASTMH meeting. I did. I, I, I didn't have to hold the worm. Everybody knew what the worm was. But, <laughs> Just because Bill Gates can release mosquitoes, you can hold up a worm. You know, that's not a hell of a bad hey, That's a damn good idea. The next time I go, I'm going to bring that carboy of worms. It's right? a good idea. Or yeah. show the, the, the carboy of worms. Bring a jar of worms. Bring yeah. a jar, jar of worms. That's jar right. worms. All right. Um, Dan, uh, Daniel, the next one is uh, for you. 
Anthony writes, I found fascinating that the tropical medicine to neglected tropical diseases were now at global medicine. Mm -hmm. This new normal clearly is a facet of the global village. Yeah. It's also a harsh reminder that McLuhan's prediction of a tsunami of primitivism enabled by technology was not a promise of perfection, but a prophecy of doom. <laughs> That's Marshall McLuhan, I presume. Mm -hmm. referring to, sure. Do you know that he predicted a tsunami of primitivism enabled by technology. <laughs> Why is that? Because people so would... you don't have uh, to do anything anymore. It's all anything, been done yeah. for you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Auto autonomous everythings. Hmm. I was thinking of that today, you know, in terms of, you know, everyone has a cell phone and has anyone ever... So Apple made smartphones and everyone buys them and the other companies make them too. But did anyone ever stop to think whether this was a good idea? <laughs> no, of course. You know, everyone's walking around looking at their phones. And I saw an article in the Times today, which is going to be my pick on TWIV this week, but I'll give you a preview. It's a it's an article which suggests that, well, it's by this teacher who doesn't let her students use laptops in her class because hmm. she says students don't learn as well. And there's some studies that support that. When you type really quickly, it's just going through your head really fast, whereas when you write it, there's evidence that you pick it up better. So, yeah. you know, this technology might not be all that good for us. Yeah, or at least misused technology. How's that? Well, I don't think using a laptop or a cell phone is misusing it, but it just might not be. No, in class, it might be a misuse of it. Whereas if you go home and you use it for review, it might be good. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out the irony because I read one of those studies this morning, coincidentally, and mm. on my computer, <laughs> and then I emailed it to my 17-year-old <laughs> who will read it on her phone. Yeah. And so, it was easy to get the information out. But it, but it, that is, I think that is true. When you sit there with a piece of paper and a pen, there's a processing. You can't write everything down the way some people now just sort of type out the lecture as it's coming. They, you have to process and uh, make notes instead of just yeah. copying it down. So yeah, it's a challenge. The next one's from Bill, who writes, I'm even further behind listening to TWIP than I am on TWIV, but perhaps now that the baseball and college football seasons are over, I will catch up. A friend just shared this Navy Times article. Ever heard of this before? The VA continues to get lots of bad press, but perhaps they can figure this out. As a Navy veteran who spent time in Southeast Asia, well, I was stationed in Bangkok and living in a downtown hotel in 1975, I am concerned. So this is an article in Military Times, which uh, is showing that a lot of the, peop a lot of the uh, veterans who were in Vietnam uh, have liver flukes. Right, mm. and they say here uh, that this is a slow killing parasite, and they're they're concerned. Of Fifty blood samples submitted, more than twenty percent came back positive for liver fluke antibodies. Well, <laughs> so gentlemen, please tell me why this would be a concern. I've got this article up here, and it says um, a link between liver flukes ingested through raw or undercooked fish. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not the liver fluke that you and I are commonly think of. When you think of a liver fluke, you think of fasciola hepatica, right. which is not acquired by eating fish, but rather by eating contaminated plant life, like watercress. Right. So the one they're referring to here is probably clonorchus and uh, opistorchus. And the cl slow killing is the... Uh, Cholangioitis, uh, uh, the cholangio um, carcinomas Carcinoma. that you get by long term exposure to I the see. secretions of the parasite. So um, it means, of course, that all the veterans of, of Vietnam should have had their stools examined. And if this parasite was found, they should have given them the right drug so they shouldn't have this anymore. You know, I'll, I'll agree with you, Dixon, that they're probably talking about op Opus thorcus, right? If you're in Thailand, that would be the most common um, right. to have this association. And uh, this has actually been a little bit in the um, in the legal arena lately because there really? are, you know, just think about the timing of when we were um, engaged in that police action, I believe it was, <laughs> in uh, Vietnam. Yeah. And um, the veterans now are at a certain age where the, the time has gone by. So now um, a number of them have developed uh, cholangiocarcinoma, yes. which is not a common type of bile duct cancer. No. And so it raises this question. If you spend time in Vietnam, you now have cholangiocarcinoma, um, you know, can you go to the government and say, I developed this as a consequence of um, serving in that right. part of the world? And not only that, I wasn't given a proper stool exam when I mustered out 
to show me that I did, that I either did or did not have this parasite. Malaria, they were very concerned about, uh, yeah. but something like Clonorchis, they didn't even think about. So this is not a liver fluke. No, it's a bile duct fluke. Yeah, so this article is wrong. Well, uh, yeah, it is. It, it it it's a misnomer that they've put onto this one, but it's mm. it's accurate. It's a fluke, and it, it does have long term consequences. And Bill, by the way, is Bill Spindler. Really? He's Kathy's this, brother. Ah, uh, remarkable. That's why he's listening. How interesting. Okay, Twitter. Bill, <laughs> you, you've done a good thing. Um, I, I don't know if I'm going to give them too hard a time. I mean, I think people often refer to these flukes as liver flukes as well. So yeah, I do too. I do too. But, but they, when they showed the pictures, I knew instantly that it wasn't uh, fasciola because they're huge. The mm -hmm. fasciola is as big as a small leaf. These were little tiny yeah. floating parasites. So they're, they're dangerous. Then they should be diagnosed and then they should be treated. Absolutely right. Yeah. There's an easy right. treatment. And it is tough as as is coming up here. It can be it could be decades down right. the road right. that someone right. develops so, the cancer. Right. So the bottom line is that it's treatable. It is treatable. Well, it's treatable if you treated the liver fluke way back when they mustered out. Now, uh, if they no. have a cholangiocarcinoma, they may end up dying. No, that's not treatable, but the yeah. fluke infection but is they have treatable. But fluke, but not yet cholangiocarcinoma right. that could right. be treated. That's, right. okay. that's correct. And not everybody who has this fluke, even so, for long-term uh, purposes, Bill, develops it. if you're concerned, go get, find a parasitologist. <laughs> Infectious disease, doc. <laughs> right. You're in. You're in Ann Arbor. You can go to the University Medical Center and you bet. see if you have it. Yep. And uh, get treated. That's right. And tell them Daniel Griffin sent you. Indeed. Yeah. Fact. No. And and we should. I guess we should reinforce the way you want to do this is you want to do um, stool oven parasites every other day for a minimum of three times. That's right. Um. Mm. So mm. that's right. Nice. I must say that, as a side note, my wife will be going down to Antarctica in December, so maybe she'll run into Bill. I doubt it. <laughs> Probably she'll never get to the Palmer yeah. Station. But I guess we should throw in, too, this is important, how long does uh, an Ophis orcus live, right? Because what, yeah. what we're going to suggest here is you're, you're in Vietnam, and when did the Vietnam um, police action end? 76. Guys, 1976. 76. Yeah, okay. exactly, 1976. So that was... Um, more than 26 years ago, right? That's not... And, and why do I pick 26 years? Is that we think 26, 30 years, we do not think Opus Orcus lives beyond 30 years. Do, no. Would you agree, Dixon? I would, I'm going to so, look that up right now because I know we looked this up when we wrote these things. And yeah. So, so I, I would actually say when you look at the time span here, you're saying 40 years ago you're in Vietnam. I don't think, you know, but the interesting thing, that being said, right, when we think that is this... Apparently, this small pilot study, they're saying, um, they say of the 50 blood samples submitted, more than 20% came positive for the antibodies. So the antibodies are going to show that these people were exposed. Right. It doesn't mean that they still have the live flukes. So, you know, we'll wait for Dixon to look this up. But I think more than 30 years, you're past the life, the longest lifespan of an opus thoracus. So if you had this, it's it's dead, but is the damage already done? Um, that's a concern. What do you find, Dixon? Well, we didn't have it in the life cycle because it wasn't important to talk about it in the life cycle. So I'm looking under uh, prevention and control. So, Dixon, go to page 421, um, the left side near the bottom. It says each parasite may live for up to 26 years in the biliary system. 26 years. Mm. So I think we're past that. We are. Uh, we are. But yeah, the so carcinoma that, wouldn't wouldn't go away even after the worms leave. So yeah, these could be people problem. in their late stages of carcinoma, which occurred during their experience with the parasite, but extends beyond the life of the parasite itself. So, yeah, so the oncogenic the, process started, right. and yeah. now we're seeing the, pro it the problem is they're exactly. doing antibody diagnosis, so they're all going to have antibodies, even if the parasite is long yeah, gone, right? Maybe they should do DNA studies. That's what they should actually. Do. Yeah, they're... well, I would. Yeah, I wouldn't think a Vietnam vet at this point. You know, as we we did the math here, forty, fifty. You know, we're getting to the point where it was a long time ago. I wouldn't think any of them would still have live parasites. I would agree. Lives. I would agree. I would definitely agree. Okay. One more from Anthony, who sends a link to an article, and he says, "For who knows what reason, AccuWeather decided that I needed to see this ad." <laughs> and this is an ad from. Protect your field from sudden death syndrome and nematodes. So it's a 
an ad for a treatment, a seed treatment to protect against nematodes. Okay. So maybe because he listens to TWIP or Urban Ag, or Urban they Ag. targeted him with this. Got it. Fungal parasites don't seem to be discussed much. They are eukaryotes too. Yeah, they deserve some love. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we should do our random generator now and find out who won. That's book. right. That's right. All right. I'm, I got. I was supposed to. Uh, no, Least we forget. Okay, so we had ten guesses, right? Ten. Random number generator dot org generate a number between one and ten. Are you ready? Roll the dice. Roll, roll the drums. Generate number. Number six. Ta-da! Who's the winner here? It is one of the Melissas. Melissa from UC San Diego. UC San Diego. There you go. Winner. Coming at you. We need your address. So, Melissa from San Diego, please send us your mailing address and we shall Tickers. ship you. We do. This one is in the U.S. I'm happy because sending these books to the U.K., which is the last one, <laughs> it costs more than the book. Exactly. Exactly. But not worth more than the book. It but not worth more. All right. Okay. Congratulations to Melissa. That's TWIP143. We are screaming down the road towards episode 200. Yeah, it's going to be a while. It'll be a while. It may be coincident with our meeting in Austin. That would be very right. interesting. <laughs> well, 43, we need another 60, 57. We do, it takes uh, 57, we do, actually, Every we other. do two a month, right? So that's 100 a year. It is. Why are we moving so I, slowly? I, I, think, <laughs> I feel like you may have done the math wrong. So two a month, and there's 12 months. So I'm doing two times oh, 12. Oh, months. I'm doing this in my head. <laughs> I'm thinking of 52 <laughs> weeks a year. Yeah, 24, isn't it? Yeah, we're not going to make it for uh, Austin. No, nope. we won't. It might be Christmas. Anyway, Apple Podcast, microbe.tv slash twip. We'd love to have your financial support, Patreon, mm. et cetera. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Send us your questions, your comments, your Case study guesses. Twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Medical Center. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Pleasure as always. By the way, Daniel, on Twiv this past week, um, uh, Alan Dove's pick was a sailboat. Right. <laughs> and, oh. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to pull this up now. He called it... Um, Sail Magazine it called it one of the best boats of 2018. It's a Fontaine Pajot Saona 47. Oh. Do you know that? Now, is this a uh, a catamaran? Yes, it is. Yes, that's a beautiful catamaran. <laughs> I'm anti-catamarans, but I still... Oh, dear. <laughs> you are anti-catamarans? <laughs> you know, I just... Uh, no, I'm not anti-catamarans. But uh, it, that is a beautiful boat, yes. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Anyone wants to send me one? <laughs> Dixon de Pommier, Trichinella.org, the Living River.org, and Parasites Without Borders.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. As we have done this episode, the sun is set. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music you hear on Twip is by Ronald Jenkies, RonaldJenkies.com. Thanks to ASM for their support of Twip. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic.